yeah apologies 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 for this but yeah um, that being said and now invite the first speaker from side opposition Am I audible? Amazing. Yes, you are. I like POIs audibly. Okay, so via, via the audio. Panel, don't buy in their, into their characterization of scientists just somehow saving public discourse. We believe that public issues are inherently controversial. We believe that even in the proposition's best case, where they only get well-informed like, um, like people to be on these public discussions, which we believe is unlikely, as I'm going to analyze in the following, um, we believe that it's unlikely that people, one, are going to listen to scientists because they're just not charismatic enough, and therefore their ability to shape public discourse is incredibly limited. And secondly, even if so, we believe that even public, uh, we believe that even scientists can have a political bias. Even biologists can believe that trans women aren't real, that trans men aren't real. We believe that for, uh, with uh, with that in mind, let's move to the uh, rebuttal on. Uh, decades. Okay, firstly, unlike um, our counter model, if they want to talk about parties funding these uh, channels, we oppose that as well. We believe that on uh, that we have the fear to assume that they can't fund this uh, on our side as well. But moving on to then their first argument on polarization, where they uh, bring to you like the characterization of like three kinds of people. I want to tackle these three kinds of people exactly. They talk to you one about ignorant viewers and how they are not going to change on either side. In my substantive, I'm going to talk about why on their side, it's actually going to be worse and these people are going to be radicalized. Secondly, on like the well-informed people, we believe it's likely that pe these people engage with like different kinds of media under their side of the house. We believe that it's limited to like the silent middle. What's the impact on the silent middle, like the third group, the passive people that they like to talk about? And we believe that it's likely to be three things. Either we believe that the information that they, uh, that they get doesn't change their views. This is because people are largely value driven. We believe that the extent that people are open to like to have different views considered in their own decision making is limited because they're shaped by like family and um, because that's, uh, of their surrounding, because of all of these things. We believe that it's likely that people uh, just will still lean to like the bias of one side. It's likely that they're not going to uh, like get out of the echo chamber. Second thing then, we believe that if you hit people with this massive amount of different information, like if you want to claim an impact of like having massive massive expansion of public debate, a lot of people having like really nuanced stances on things, it's just too much for a lot of people to digest. The impact here is that people get confused and it's more likely that on proposition they disengage from watching the news and from politics completely. Thirdly then, the most important mechanism here is that at best these people buy into populism. Why is this? Because we believe that if you portray different people um, like uh, different kinds of people, like one, like moderate people or like liberal people and then populists, like it's way less, way more likely that on the same uh, display in airtime, people are going to buy into populist narratives because they're easier to understand and because that's what uh, they want to buy into. Okay, then lastly, um, why is the fairness doctrine not likely to be well enforced on the, uh, their side of the house? We believe that one, it's like if they want to claim some kind of committee that can like have an overview on this, it's likely that a committee can never be neutral because it's a government agency and thus controlled by politicians. At best, it's like indirectly like the FCC in the 70s, where they cracked down more on like um more on like certain types of the political spectrum and like more these radio broadcast uh, things. That, yeah. Then secondly, on why their, baron, uh, their panel can be biased too, is that one, it's likely to be mostly old white men is like with every other uh, field of society. Why should they suddenly get more representation than that anywhere else? It matters crucially for our second argument on marginalized groups. Then second reason why they can't uh, have a good implementation is because defin the definition of fairness is really blurry. Note that something can be hurtful, but not hate speech. So for example, when Jordan Peterson says that if a successful woman wants to not be harassed in the workplace, a it's a critical decision to wear makeup. These kinds of things can't be regulated under your side of the house. Second thing is that candidates can be unrepresentative of a party, but there's no clear line. If they want to claim that you get adequate representation, there's no clear line on this. No, thank you. This means that there are loopholes for abuse and that uh, this means that TV broadcasters are unlikely to be harshly controlled. And even if they're controlled, this is likely to be uh, in favor of the current government, what, uh, government uh, bodies and overrepresented groups in society. Why is this important? This is important because proposition is unlikely to get any of the benefits they're claiming because they have to explain why the fairness doctrine will work perfectly. And secondly, there's an additional harm because you get a veil of credibility where broadcasters can claim to be unbiased, even if they're not. Okay, then moving on to the substantive part on like this case, assuming the best case of proposition where they have a perfect implementation. First argument then on radicalization on the most extreme parts of the spectrum that they'd claim to not change under their side of the house. 
we read that these people have an incentive to watch the news in the status quo because they get some information, but in their frame. So this looks like from a pro-life perspective, people, people wanting to know when abortion rights change, but from a perspective of why this is bad. This means that people only stick to a channel if it's convenient enough for them to do so. This only means that uh, this also means that there's an influence for people who dictate whether the frame is still extreme enough for people like Donald Trump to shape these things. What happens then a proposition is that they claim exposure to the other side of the spectrum, like people questioning their views in their best case. We believe that's what it's what's more likely is that people don't want to listen to them for the, uh, listen to this for two reasons. One, people are scared of having their opinion challenged because of human psychology that is more convenient to stick to your own opinion. And it means like people are unlikely to take the active decision to go against their default and to be open to this. Secondly, even if you don't buy this, um, especially for people who are at the extremes of the spe uh, spe spectrum, and they have lost the perception that other viewpoints have a legitimacy. So this looks like current news outlets, like their current news outlets framing news um, in a way that they have to uh, an interest to appeal to people who already question the system. This looks like claims that the other sides are just fake news. This looks like uh, playing into conspiracy theories and like taking a defensive position uh, against like liberals, for example, with Fox News. This means that portraying the other side is seen as an active attack on the value of these people on proposition. So, this is, so for example, like portraying AOC on like Fox News, defense abortion rights is viewed as publicly defending murder. What happens then as an impact is that people move away from news channels to alternative, more extreme news sources where they feel themselves confirmed. This is likely to be networks like the True Social or Telegram because it's an assembly of people who like you agree that the other news become too soft or infiltrated. This looks like the more liberal people are portrayed as legitimate on proposition and the more equity regulations they want to claim, the more this is true. What does this look like then? One, this looks like Fox News already having lost a, lost a significant number of viewers only by moving from the election was stolen to, uh, to uh, spending airtime on the election was lost. This looks like Trump calling people to boycott Twitter and moving to Truth Social because it's the only place where freedom of speech is left. Note that there's a significant, significant number of people who already buy into this. This is even more so on proposition. Why is this incredibly bad? One, because of less accountability that other media outlets and in the status quo still call out in outlets like Fox News and show their ridicule or danger some statements. And secondly, because of more uh, actionability. Before I move on, I'll take a point, PY. Um, yeah, on your point about people losing interest in news because it's no longer understandable, it's in the best interest of these broadcast companies to make news digestible so that they keep viewership up. Isn't that going to essentially guarantee that people are still engaged and now just getting more information? If you want to claim your best case that uh, debates are going to be simplified, this plays more into the fact that populism is going to be more responded to on your side of the house because they are the most likely ones to be simple and to appeal to people. Moving on then on why actionability in these news outlets is so bad because alter uh, alternative new networks like True Social or like uh, Telegram have more possibility to organize things, which means that it's more likely that we get things like a new January 6th on the their side. Why does this group and this argument win us this debate? Be one, because the likelihood of harm that occurs, like and, and like the, the, the scope of harm that might occur under a new January 6th is incredibly big. Secondly, because it's irreversible, because you can never get these people back. And thirdly, because we prove that it's unlikely to change for the better on opposition. Then lastly, shortly, on marginalized groups. Because we see that these motion, this motion also applies to topics that discuss marginalized groups, things like women's rights, police violence against people of color, etc. In the status quo, broadcasters have a right to treat the systemic issues as an object objective problem. On proposition, broadcasters are forced to portray them as uh, issues of like a public discussion because you have to include an opposition. This is extremely harmful because marginalized groups now have to put up with people like Jordan Peterson telling them that like um, trans women are not real women on uh, this. This looks like them having to put up with Ben Shapiro telling them that women can't be this. We believe that people deserve a safe space and the news, and this is why you vote opposition. Thanks, speaker, for the final remarks. I now invite the second speaker from side proposition. Okay, uh, am I audible? And my time starts now. Look, Judge, the minute Team Germany lost this debate was the minute that they conceded to all the numerous harms that we give you as a direct result of political polarization and radicalization, yet do nothing on their side of the house to combat it. I'm going to do a few things in the speech. Firstly, a few extraneous rebuttals. Then I'm going to talk about their main substantive on like radicalization and people leaving these broadcast media for like worse forms of media, and then give a piece of substantive. So firstly, a few extraneous rebuttals. 
The essentially only reason they say as to why people are no longer going to watch the news on our side of the house is one, because scientists are like not very like telegenic and aren't very like, you know, passionate people don't want to watch them. And secondly, because scientists have differing opinions. So a few reasons why this falls. Firstly, it's simply not true that scientists can't be like fun, engaging personalities. I mean, look at like Bill Nye, the science guy. Children, adults all love him, love watching him. They can be charismatic. But also what, like what we bring up at the point of information is that news sources are really, really good at making things that might seem boring on certain levels, very engaging and fun to watch. We think that news sources do this all the time. They'll be able to continue doing it on our side of the house. Secondly, this point here on there being like very different opinions from scientists. So yes, this is the point. We understand that some science-based issues and some political issues do have a variety of opinions. This is why we prefer a world in which those opinions are published and like mandatorily published so that everyone is forced to engage with them. So yes, we are like, I think it's important that we present equal views, give different voices to different scientists or different politicians who believe different things. And I would also point out that on the issue of scientists, we would much prefer scientists taking the charge on science-based issues than politicians being mouthpieces for things that they really don't have any credit like credit like credits to talk, be talking about on this level uh that falls the ne this next like weird point now on populism so first of all populism is symmetrical i mean populism exists in the status quo and they have like mouthpieces through existing news sources in the status quo to exist so at our worst that's absolutely symmetrical but i would argue that populism is more likely on their side of the house because nothing breeds climate breeds populism more than a climate of hatred and more than a climate of like a majority of people hating the minority of people in different places at worst populism is like symmetrical at best it falls much more heavily on their side of the house and finally now on the model so like look we're doing our absolute best to prevent bias. They set an unreasonably high bar when they say we need to be perfect, admit like being like deciding what is news, what is like gonna be like fall into the fairness doctrine, what isn't. Look, we just need to be able to show that compared to the terrible status quo, there is going to be an improvement. Look, we tell you that there are going to be three, like people uh, like from across the political spectrum represented. We're gonna have three Republicans, three Democrats, three independents. We tell you this worked in Arizona. And we tell you that things like making sure that Trump is going to be allowed to say whatever he wants, isn't going to happen when you have people from the other side of the political spectrum saying no this is fake news we're not going to allow this to be broadcast to people and everyday civilians realistically our model still stands they need to help push like much harder for it to topple but now more importantly on these ideas of radicalization so the first claim that they make here is that people have different views yes we do concede that people have different views that's human nature but i would point out there's a big difference between having different views and only ever having access to those views and only ever seeing those views represented on news sources that is the status quo and that is the mechanism we give you on our side of the house as to why when you only have access to one type of news and one like left wing or right wing of news is when you get radicalization we tell you that with social media, through things like the algorithm, once you watch one article on Fox News, that our algorithm will only ever recommend you articles from Fox News. That forces you to not engage with the other side. We tell you that there is this an economic incentive from political parties for these news sources to only publish one side of the information. This is the moment when you get radicalization and you get people demonizing the other side. No, that is very ironic that they talk about things like the January 6th like riots when this is a direct result of the polit political polarization which exists in a status quo and they do nothing to stop. This is the point where you believe that the opposite side is spreading lies. This is the point where you do not want to engage. We make it happen on our side of the house and Germany essentially does nothing to make it stop. And lastly now on this idea of like people leaving social media. So I'd say a few things to this. Firstly, social media is heavily regulated as to misinformation and disinformation. So I would argue that to an increasing extent and over time, there's going to be less of an ability for people to leave mainstream broadcast news sources and access misinformation and alt-right or alt-left news on social media. I'd argue that that is generally speaking, going in a positive direction in terms of not even having access to it in the first place. If that's not having something they have access to, on our side of the house, they're at least forced to engage with multiple sides of the spectrum. But secondly, they concede to our characterization of a, ma of a majority of viewers being what we call passive viewers people who are not like actively seek like actively not engaging with the other side note that going to radical news sources on like underground social media sites takes a large amount of initiative initiative which your everyday average viewer does not have so therefore even if we can see that a small number of people who are openly ignorant are seeking out misinformation as a result of this that is not enough to sway things like elections that is not enough to cause the riots we saw on january 6th that is not enough to have the radicalization that we see in our everyday life pervade politics we still support it on our side of the house i'll take the point before moving on the more liberals you claim to be on Fox News to, uh, to be able to moderate these people, the more people are going to move to true social. How are they going to moderate if they just move away completely without, an, uh, without any way for regulation? Okay, look, I just touched on this. I'll add a little bit just like in case you want it. 
the majority of broadcast news networks have started moving towards social media, which means that now in the status quo, people can access Fox News on social media, people can access CNN on, so on social media. Therefore, once we fix this problem on Fox News, on CNN, from the broadcasting perspective, that simultaneously solves the problem on the social media perspective, even if we buy that people are getting the majority of their news from social media. So thirdly, now how we strengthen through all, like, all three branches of government. Firstly, democratic institutions in and of themselves. So in the status quo, politics has converted from an institution which is meant to discuss policy and solutions to our most pressing issues to one in which politicians focus most of their time attacking other people for being immoral bigots. And note that the, like, the reason that they do this is because in part of partisan news sources looking to gather sound bites, which will be published by like published on news sources and gain attention both for the company and for the politician. Therefore, we have people like Bolsonaro in Brazil attacking the Supreme Court to end up on Beja, or AOC going on a diatribe against Kevin McCarthy to get on MSNBC, and together they feed the media beast. And more so than that, we exist in a political climate where party lines cannot ever be crossed, which is to say if a Republican votes out of the party, like when, like, like when Liz Cheney did when she spoke out against Trump's role in the Capitol riots and was removed as the leader of the House of Representatives, they will immediately be outcast from the party, even if that piece of policy or what they were saying is not something that their voting constituents would support. So in essence, bipartisan policy and consensus is becoming increasingly rare. Therefore, on our side of the house, by lessening the echo chamber and stopping right and left wing radicalization, but also by forcing opposing views to be humanized and respected, the fairness doctrine increases the likelihood of two things. Firstly, better policy, because politics is now focused on policy as opposed to politicians' personalities. And secondly, more bipartisan policy, because now opposing viewpoints are not demonized to the extent that they are now. Secondly, we strengthen the, ju the judicial branch. So over time, judicial branches, and especially the Supreme Court, have become a pawn for political zealots. So as opposed to interpreting the Constitution and up upholding established law as is, its, as is its purpose, judges now have essentially become political activists. So judi judicial nominations are now political pawns because the nomination process has been so politicized and so politicized that qualifications are now less important than political belief and political affiliation. So now, once on our side of the house, we make issues less polarized and less radicalized and are able to add some nuance to political discussions, we are able to look at court cases in the context of the law and not in the context of party lines or political affiliation, as well as instilling respect for the institution as a whole, which largely lacks in the status quo. And finally, we improve the news. Note that for most of history, the news was meant to be the fourth branch of government, which informed the population justly and kept a check on the government. Now we do this because of everything we tell you in first. By solving for the echo chamber and political polarization, we allow for news systems to do their job as opposed to being one-sided political pawns which spout the views of whoever wants to fund them. For all of these reasons, I'm very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for defined remarks. I now invite the second speaker from side opposition. Oh, uh, few eyes in chat, please. Perfect. Panel, I'm unsure in what worlds the proposition lives in, because last time I checked, 30% of the US population doesn't believe that trans people are real. 50% of the US population believes that the election was stolen. This means under a fairness doctrine, you necessarily have to give 50% of your airtime to people who claim that the election system is fraudulent. I think they're going to end up with a world where populism becomes worse because people are unlikely to understand the nuance in the argument behind why the election system works rather than Trump saying, well, it just doesn't. Populism panel, and I think this is incredibly important, is effective because it's simple and this means people will always buy into that rather than some complicated metric. I think proposition thus loses this debate. On that, based on that. I want to talk about four things in the speech broadly. I just want to first make some notes on model and strategic push that was completely ignored in Clara's speech. Then I want to talk about the three groups that are important in this debate, the silent middle radicals and marginalized groups. And lastly, I want to talk about why they decrease the quality of journalism and we'll clash that with the second speaker argument. Let's firstly talk about the model because panel, I'm just incredibly confused. 
they talk about wanting to have scientists on that show, but also somehow Republicans and Democrats will be on there. I think if Republicans and Democrats are on there, they can't like claim all the benefits of, well, this speech is so great, right? Panel, look at how Trump and Hillary Clinton, look at how Trump and Joe Biden talk to each other in the presidential debates even then, right? Even when the pressure was so high, they couldn't say one nice thing about each other. Donald Trump called Joe Biden sleepy Joe, insulted him about being old. I think it's unlikely that they ever regulate this because how would you make that hate speech, right? There's no clear line on that, right? I think this means that likely they end up with a situation where they have to give a platform to transphobe sexist people who believe the election was stolen. I secondly think that their push on like, oh, broadcasters are paid off, they only radicalize on your side isn't true, right? I think one, it's largely untrue that like even like like channels like Fox News are like sponsored by partisan donors because they still have an incentive as the editorial board to stay independent from large people, who large financial people. But second, even if that were true, I think these channels largely don't radicalize because I think one, that deters moderates. Even Fox News has more moderate Republican viewers. I think they're unlikely to want to cater to the extreme fringes, especially because they can already watch things like NRA TV. This is why we see that Fox News largely shied away from the statement, well, the election was stolen, right? I think this is largely then something that we already see, like not the extreme radicalization, but rather much rather a move to the middle, like somewhat or just staying in that sector. I think even if that were true, I think that's better because people can more easily engage with that. And that's largely what they want to talk to you about, the silent middle. Panel, I just want to make sure because before I come to clash and like responding to proposition, because what Clara talked to you about from one minute was the idea that it's unlikely that because like the past precedent has never worked, this would work in propositions model, right? She tells you about how the government is likely to control that agency and you're likely to end up with a partisan institution that controls democratic discourse. This is just horrible in and of itself. Second, that panel is likely to be not represented because one has a panel ever represented in like any kind of political institution before. I think it's unlikely that they can claim this. And even if the definition of fairness is so blurry that they need to prove why this will be good and effective, because otherwise they end up with a world where right wing moderate, like right wing extremists are likely to control speech on their side of the house. This is a strategic push they have to respond to. Otherwise, they automatically lose because they give the stamp of approval, the veil of credibility to like them. Um, to channels who are still likely to not be like neutral as they claim on their side of the house. I think to claim any benefit, they need to respond to that in second uh, in a third proposition. But even if they are untrue, let's engage with what they tell you. No, thank you. I think the silent middle is unlikely to ever change. And right, that's what we tell you about populism. How if you're presented with a large amount of viewpoints that are likely to be like very different, there is a cognitive dissonance in me understanding that information and processing it. I think that means likely that I buy into the most populist claim that is on there. I think this already happens in the status quo. And don't let like don't let yourself get confused by second proposition arguing well, but like at best this is symmetric. No, it isn't panel. At best, this becomes worse on their side of the house, right? I think the problem becomes that because they now have to air transphobes and such, more people buy into these harmful things, more people buy into populism. I think the problem is that it will be always advantageous for politicians to push populist rhetoric on either side of the house. This becomes worse on their side of the house because you give these populists more of a platform to engage. I think thus for people who aren't populists, it becomes incredibly harder to convince anyone because you always need to talk to populists. You can never explain the intricacies of your argument and convince real Democrats why it's bullshit to close the border panel. I think this is incredibly important because it means that there's a bigger harm to the silent middle than a benefit to them actually de-radicalizing. By that, we're already taking down second speaker's argument, right? But let's engage with radicals then because the only push here is, well, social media is regulated. Panel, is it really, does it work with Twitter? I'm unsure this is even true. But even if it were true, what we're pushing is the idea that you move to channels that aren't regulated like Truth Social, and that's incredibly different to Twitter. Because it's a channel that is so far right that most people don't know about it, and most journalists can never get in and even join and like uncover this idea, right? I think the problem is that the alt-right knows about this channel, moves there, and it completely disappear until things like January 6th happen. Because of the immense actionability where you now know people that want to storm the Capitol with you. And even if you don't believe that the impact of this is so big. I think the problem is that you get an intense radicalized group that can now interact and look, uh, push each other up about attacking trans people, attacking minorities on the streets. This is incredibly bad. And I don't think it's fair for them to push that this is minority. Why panel? Because I think the more they want to claim a neutralization of the middle, the more, like of Fox News essentially, the more people want to move away from Fox News because you're suddenly being 
like like regulated by the middle you're being regulated by the weird democrats by the evil other side and thus you want to move away to better platforms i think thus this is the big winning because of the immediate actionability of that even if they want to claim that they moderate the new like the, the the silent middle essentially you have to get these people to vote you have to get them out on the streets and this is way harder than like literally like um getting like like like, the, then like having these people smash streets smash stones at your car before i move on to marginalized groups in my own arguments yes please yeah so doesn't the speaker agree that there are at least some people in the world who don't believe that trans people are real as a direct result of them not accessing valid and moderate news sources no, I don't think that think that's the case, right? Because I think the difficulty with emoting, like emoting with these statements, is that you have to change your whole worldview, right? Where these things like, oh, but biology is real. You can't change biology, are so deeply ingrained in you that it's unlikely to ever change on either side of the house. I think at best they're more likely to bind to biology. Let's quickly address marginalized groups. I think they never respond to this. This is incredibly harmful and debate winning for us because you harm them on either side of the house because you need to platform views that actively harm them. With that, why do we decrease the quality of journalism uniquely on proposition? Because I think journalism is good because of critical questions, right? It makes news accessible to people because you can now deal with it when scenarios are broken down to you. This doesn't happen anymore for two reasons. One, because self-censorship means that journalists avoid critical and controversial questions where they're incredibly scared of being fired or fined when they write reports or articles. An example of this is a BBC journalist that covered Black Lives Matter protests in London and was fired because her coverage was deemed too biased just because she reported on one person more of that was a part of the protesters. I think you miss out on crucial coverage with that piece of self-censorship. Then second, you're less able to take a side on scandals, right? Because the problem becomes that because you want to get to this neutrality so much, especially if you're literally imprisoned, if you break that, I think the problem becomes that you soften your wording and rather say like, oh, like maybe President Trump broke his constitutional mandate, rather than saying that was illegal panel, that was an insurrection and people were killed. This is extremely important because proposition loses out by their own metric, because everyone loses out on high quality journalism on either side of the house. And second, you end up with less accountability where scandals are less likely to be covered. So proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for the fine remarks. I now invite the third speaker from side proposition. Um, okay, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, and I prefer my POIs in the chat, by the way. Just give me one second to sit on my timer. Okay, if everyone's ready, then my time starts now. Panel, side opposition seems to be against radical politics and populism so long as it's only right wing. They tell us it's okay to use radical, radical rhetoric as long as it's pro-trans and anti-Donald Trump. If it's on the other side, then it's incorrect. This is something that side opposition exclusively protects panel fairness for absolutely every single political opinion. This debate is not one about judging, like placing a value on any given political opinion. This debate is about ensuring that every single political opinion can be heard by every single individual, and therefore all those individuals are able to make better, well-informed decisions and are therefore better voters. This is something that side proposition exclusively provides, and that's why we're going to win this debate. Two main points of clash in my speech today, one on where we actually decrease polarization and radicalism, and one on who gets better policy and therefore a better functioning democracy. But at the top of my speech, I just wanna do a bit of extraneous rebuttal on some minor points brought up by Team Germany. So first on this idea of whether news is complicated and difficult to digest. Look, they tell us that particularly for the silent middle, who are not super, super engaged in po politics, yet make up the majority of citizens around the world, News is an extremely difficult thing for them to understand. Look, yet somehow this is only the case in our world where news has to be shared on both sides, right? Look, the reality is that if news is complicated in our world, it's also extremely complicated inside Germany's world, right? We in fact think that news is likely going to be more digestible and in our side of the house where politicians have to like improve the quality of their writing and speeches if they want to actually gain support by virtue of the fact that individuals are not only hearing their opinion Opinions, but rather the opinions of essentially every other politician who has a stance on a given issue, right? This is why we're also going to see the quality of journalism increase on our side of the house, contrary to what G Germany was telling you. Again, because journalism for a given opinion needs to be of a higher quality that's going to convince individuals who are no longer convinced simply by the fact that it's the only thing they're hearing, but because of the fact that they are like forced to choose between a number of opinions, right? Now this idea of just like briefly clarifying our model, I'm like just 
a kind of an overall point on like the purpose of this debate, right? The point is that we're introducing a model that's meant to improve the status quo because Germany never provided us with a counter model that's going to do better. They're by virtue, like defending the status quo, right? So they need to show that our world is going to be significantly worse or even marginally worse than the status quo. So long as we can prove that even one person is less radicalized in our world, we have won this debate because Germany never gave us a counter model that's supposed to be better, right? Look, I just wanna clarify what that model is again. We told you and it's like is going to deal with the point about scientists being like uncharismatic or whatever we told you we're going to have a panel of experts both scientists and politicians to like agree with the fact that some people do have bias regardless of whether how hard they try to fight it or not right we're going to have people from every single side of like the political spectrum they tell us this is impossible we literally told you from first that it literally happened in arizona to prevent gerrymandering we had three democrats three republicans and three independents the world in which those kind of people can never agree judges is side opposition's world right the world in which those people only hear their own opinions so long as we're furthering political discourse, which is exactly what our model seeks to do, we're actually going to get a more efficient panel over time in our world, right? So now this idea about like briefly, I just want to touch on whether we're like protecting marginalized groups and doing enough for minorities. Look, a couple things here. They tell us that they want minorities to have a safe space. They don't want them to get on the internet and feel like they're being bullied by Jordan Patterson and Ben Shapiro. Look, I also want every individual in the world to feel comfortable. The reality is that that's literally not what the world looks like, panel. The purpose of news is not to make you feel safe, cushioned, and comfortable. The purpose of news, when it's at its best, is to challenge what you know about the world that you live in, right? That's exactly why we're okay with having some people have to hear other opinions, right? Because you may disagree with one thing Jordan Peterson says, but if that blocks you from listening to the rest of his platform, you may miss out on something that you actually do agree with, right? We support safe spaces and all that. We just don't think that news has that responsibility and they've never shown us why it necessarily does, right? Now to move on to this point about polarization and public discourse and populism here. So first I'm going to address this point about people moving to like truly and parlor and all that. A couple things here. One, no part of our model is exclusive with the regulation of parlor and truly. We can get up here and tell you that we support these apps being disbanded and destroyed while simultaneously supporting the fairness doctrine, right? They never told us why these are suddenly exclusive. Therefore, it has literally nothing to do with breaking down our model, right? But additionally, even if this isn't the case and we have to support a world in which parlor and truly still exist i'm going to tell you why that's like not necessarily a case winning point for germany right they conceded it in their speech just now most people don't even know about truly this is exactly why this is not as dangerous of a point as side opposition thinks it is the reality is that the only individuals who are going to shift towards truly and parlor are people who are probably already on there or already considering getting on there, i.e. people who are already highly radicalized, and we've already told you are likely not going to be shifted towards centrism on either side of the house. This brings me to the most important and the most heaviest like piece of our case today, which is on what Germany calls the silent middle, right? We told you from first, that this is the most important like winning point in this debate because it's the largest group in society and also because they're the ones who are going to be likely like shifted by either side of the house right so they're the ones in germany's world without media regulation are more likely to fall further and further into echo chamber just because one day they picked cnn or one day they picked fox or one day they picked whatever it is they like to read right the reality is that in our world we accept like we do a little bit more to change them, right? So they told us in first that these people are kind of scared to take active decisions about the news that they read. This is exactly the characterization that we've been telling you. Look, the reality is that in the status quo, the world that Germany supports, we put the responsibility on individuals to ensure that they are reading enough of different points of views. When in reality, the people that are kind of poisoning them and pushing them towards radicalization are these politicians and are these news companies. When we put the responsibility on them, not only are we principally making politics more fair by putting like the blame on the actual people who are pushing radicalism and populism, but also because we allow people to not have to fight really, really hard to not be radicalized by the nature of algorithms and the nature of news in Germany's world, right? So we're putting the responsibility in the right place and we're allowing people to not have to fight so hard right every time they open an article be it cnn or fox they're going to get as many sides as possible on that given issue that is going to allow them to fight those unconscious biases and get people who have much more nuanced knowledge of politics and a variety of opinions i'll take a point before a protected time can a black trans woman ever watch news on your side of the house without being harmed because there are literal identities being questioned by everyone 
Look, the reality is that that black trans woman, her, or her identity is being criticized by people in your side of the house just as often. Her choosing to not engage with that set of opinions doesn't necessarily mean that she's any safer or any better off. What it does mean is that the people who feel that way about her do not ever have to listen to her or people like her, right? If you support like the protection of these women, they're actually significantly better off on our side of the house where Fox News cannot exclusively push anti-trans, but also need to give platforms to those trans people. If we can convince even one anti-trans person to become like pro-trans by side, like opposition's own standards, we've already won this debate, right? And this is the same like narrative that I need for populism, right? The idea that every single like opinion is going to be simplified so that people still want to engage with news because that's how these companies make money. This is why populism is not suddenly taking over. Trump was a populist leader in opposition status quo, right? We think he would have gotten less popularity in our side of the house where Fox News couldn't only push the pro-Trump stuff, right? So because we're com like actively commenting polarization and allowing politicians to take nonpartisan viewpoints without being attacked by their own party, very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for the fine remarks. I now invite the third speaker from side opposition. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, pronouns, she, her, uh, a few eyes audibly, please. Yeah. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, from the very start of today's debate, we have given you multiple mechanisms on why we believe implementation and proposition won't be as rosy as they have talked to you about, right? We've told you about the blurry fairness that exists, the biases of the panel, uh, and how that would likely mean that because of all of the bureaucracy, et cetera, it's going to be incredibly hard to actually enforce it the way proposition uh, wants to have it. The reason that this matters is because we tell you there's people with a very intrinsic motivation to not do it as well as proposition likes to paint people as right this then means a proposition just to come here and tell us oh you know because there's different viewpoints just portraying everyone and everything that's just going to be the best option is not enough to engage with the scenario and characterization that we have provided you from the very first speech this then means that we can tell you about oh you know like there's going to be so many discussions about the criteria it's incredibly hard for people to know whether or not they should portray a, a, a they should platform an opinion because they're scared of being put in prison under proper position, but also because they are just um, they are just going to listen to the loudest voices that are out there and therefore probably platform someone that is incredibly hurtful because they're so passionate about that topic. This then means under proposition, they have to prove to us why their model will be implemented well, right? Because if they're not able to prove that, we tell you one, they do not have any impacts, but two, they actively make the entire situation worse by getting people the veil of credibility and people now thinking that they're valid in their own opinion, therefore meaning all of the harms that they themselves talk about, about polarization in society, etc., just gets exponentially worse under proposition. Now let me move on to the uh, to the clashes, which where like there was more discussion in the actual debate. Firstly, about the discussion that we're likely to have in the political middle ground, afterwards on radicals and then on the marginalized groups in society. Okay, on this idea on the uh, moderate uh, or like on the middle ground, proposition presents us this idea of like preventing more polarization. The idea <laughs> is telling us that they're mainly affecting passive viewers, right? We agree with this. However, we would like to add to that characterization. We tell you these people are most likely not the most open-minded, but already have preconceived notions, right? This is because one, otherwise they would already switch channels in the status quo, but two, otherwise they would not be affected under any side because they were probably either knowledgeable, informed and opinionated because they're so open-minded and willing to do research, or they're just so open that they have no opinion at all. This then means that we believe it's incredibly important to think about how these preconceived notions are going to affect people, right? We give you three detailed scenarios and people either being valued not being able to know thank you to engage with any other things because they do not understand how that works, or them just 
just being confused and disengaging because they have no information. They don't have the critical like skills to analyze anything yet because they're just so overwhelmed by the amount of information proposition is forcing on them, but also because people could just like judge case by case and not really have an information, right? And thirdly, we tell you it's incredibly harmful in proposition onto platform, so many different opinions, talking about three Democrats, three Republicans, etc. The opinions are going to be so simple that people would just choose the one that uh, like speaks to them more, which is going to be populism, right? This looks like it's easier to believe, oh, you know, inflation is simply just because of Biden, there's no other reason. This looks like, you know, the gender is just a binary, there's no reason to believe otherwise, or it just means, oh, the jobs are gone because the immigrants are coming and you see them like in your, uh, you see them around you. So that's the reason. These are the simpler ways to live your life. And this is what is going to happen under proposition. Proposition just tells us, oh, this is symmetric. We tell it explicitly this is not symmetric because proposition gives them a bigger platform, right? This analysis is more believable than the echo chamber analysis proposition gives you. Because of because if echo chambers really are just based purely on randomness and not on preconceived notions, this randomness is going to play out the same under either side of the house, right? This just means even under proposition, they're probably just randomly going to believe the first channel and the first person on that channel they come around. We don't see an impact on their side of the house. When they tell you, oh, you know, scientists and politicians will guide them, we tell you scientists are not charismatic. This is what we're seeing in the COVID pandemic, right? We tell you about like in inflation, how there's so many different like reasons why this is happening. No one believes it. We tell you about politicians, they have no incentive to do so. We don't think proposition can claim the benefits under this. The second argument on political institutions is completely dependent on the first argument working out and is actually getting more nuanced debate. We believe that completely fouls out this debate. But thirdly, we tell you, even if information is actually what matters in the debate, debate and about changing people's opinion, we are the side that achieves that better, right? Especially in the long term, we tell you about the quality of journalism that is harm so much under proposition, no thank you, because of self-censorship, because people are not able to take a side, they can't accurately portray things when things actually like go into an inc incredibly bad direction, especially because proposition talks about imprisonment. In the long term, we're the only side that can give like proper quality journalism. Onto the next slash then, onto radicals. What do we tell you here? Proposition doesn't engage with any of this like nuanced analysis, right? Because we tell you the reason why people are getting more radical is not is uh, not simply, oh, you know, like they have the option, but much rather because they now do not feel represented under proposition. They do not see themselves having the option of going to Fox News, which is still has still has some kind of accountability and still is in the public discussion, right? Because they do not see their opinions being I'm valued to the same degree on those platforms they have to move away. Before I move on, yes, please. Please engage with our point about bipartisanship in the government. In your world, we saw Roe v. Wade overturned by Republicans who were forced to stick to their most extreme party line, whereas previously Republicans protected it because it was of their personal opinion. This would be combated in our world. Please engage. We tell you that that is not true, right? We believe polarization is only going to get worse under your side of her house, especially if you need to convince so many people. Like, there's a much larger group for you. It's just so much more likely that you're just going to stick to the easy line and just make sure that that is easy to understand. We don't believe you're going to get any nuance and any discussion under proposition. Okay, then we tell you that radical people are extremely scared of being like challenged, it's comfort, etc. Proposition just tells you, oh, we're either just going to ban these platforms or, you know, like it's just not going to be mattering. We believe that that's not true, right? We have to told you so many more times that just saying social media is regulated is not enough to deal with this. We point to you like this true uh, tr Trump's uh, like true social, we tell you Twitter, we tell you Reddit, it's hard. It's already enough if on one of these platforms it's hateful. We think that is already enough to prove our point of them being more radical. When you lose this accountability, when you lose the actionability, when you're not able to do anything, we believe that's harmful. Why radicalization is so important in today's debate though is one, because it's the most immediate danger, right? They already have these platforms, they already know what to say, but also also because it's such a low barrier for them to now jump to the next point because radicals moving to be even more radical is a lot more harmful than moderates now maybe going on to some rallies etc but also because it poses a direct threat they are going to attack people if we don't stop them it's on such a large scale when you see radicals just like being so passionate being so invested in this issue but also because we believe it's just harmful when these people are there to actively hurt people we think that's the worst harm and that's the thing that we need to prevent the most in today's debate 
onto the last clash about the marginalized groups, where we tell you um, an incredibly nuanced analysis, right? We tell you in the status quo, they can just choose to not engage, and they can choose then to not be heard by all of these things. And the proposition, they're either heard when they try to inform themselves, or they just disengage because they can't deal with all of this. Proposition just tells us, oh, you know, it's not our goal, it's not our obligation to make sure they have a safe space. You could just like accept the fact that you're being challenged the entire day. Firstly, it's a factual what's being on these news platforms, right? I've already explained to you why that is incredibly likely that it's just going to be attacked. Two, in the status quo, they can actually choose to remove themselves from her. Proposition needs to tell us why they think it's okay that a person is now just going to be attacked in their own identity every single day and how that harm is not incredibly important. Thirdly, we believe they don't engage with a scenario of them on their news channels now actively worsening real life interactions, right? This is not something that is only in the media. This is something that translates into microaggressions, into attacks in real life. Proposition has to justify why they believe that is something they're willing to give up, actively harming these people, them being the sacrifice in today's debate. We're incredibly proud to oppose. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the fine remarks. I now invite the opposition to reply. Panel, at the point where we prove to you that the harm of a group of people moving to an uncontrollable field where they're radicalized and it's more likely that we get things like terrorist attacks and things like literally trying to overthrow the constitution on, prop uh, on, on proposition, any harm that they can push uh, that they can push on minor change in bias on the silent middle is out of the debate. We believe that before moving, um, believe that proposition has not been uh, engaging strategically enough in this debate, they already lose, but still further on that in clashes. But now firstly, on the strategy, because we believe that firstly, the uh, largely uh, impact of like government policy and like um, less radicalization in politics have been largely dependent on the uh, polarization argument, because and, and if you, uh, because if we prove to you that we would take the first one down, it completely falls out of the debate. But secondly, just note strategically how opposition is uh, done a lot more in the terms of engaging with like one incredibly like why this model is less is not likely to work, which I never really um, like uh, are able to reconstruct. But secondly, we've done so much on like engaging with the best case scenario. Um, that case still falls, presented to you now in two clashes. Firstly, on radicalization. Opposition brings the idea that like extreme ends of like the spectrum of viewers can't be changed anymore. And like one, they want to be confirmed in their views. And secondly, they want like this frame of the news uh, that they currently have under like a partisan use. Then we tell you what's likely is that if they see their bubble infiltrated by liberals or like some kind of equity censorship as they want to claim on that side of the house, and if the impact is that literally you go to prison if in their opinion you violate like free speech, we believe that um, they're likely to move to these extreme means like Telegram, et cetera. The only push that you get in this whole debate for proposition is that they're able to regulate this. They say that, you know, it's like that they regulate like Telegram, that it's likely that they take down all of this. We believe that they just can't outtrain themselves at the point where the, like it's first, it's incredibly unlikely that they're successful in doing this. And secondly, even if we believe that this, even like the harm that is, um, that's likely to occur on this um, is so incredibly bad that you have to uh, give us the bin based on this. We believe that secondly, on the clash of the silent middle, which is much, le uh, much less important than like the radical clash that we talked to you about, but still on this proposition tells you that there's a large portion of viewers that's likely to be uh, like swayed by like misinformation on like these partisan channels and that you want to have like balanced views to be presented to these. We give you four pushes on that on the opposition. Opposition tells you firstly, there's a veil of credibility at the point where you get uh, put like a government stamp on an imperfect system that isn't uh, like that isn't that's still going to be biased, which means that these people are still going to um, like be pushed into bias on either side of the house. Secondly, we tell you that their bias won't change even if it's perfect because they still stick to like pre notions um, of their social environment and of their values, etc. Then thirdly, we tell you that like the information that you give them is just so much to digest because you have to like fully 
engage with like the notions of both sides and like the intricacies of this and it, it gets even more if they want to came to have like five pe different people on this panel and then lastly we tell you it's most likely that these people are going to buy into populism because they're just fear mongering and because like the emotional uh, like route is still what most people go to uh, uh, down when they watch what's the difference then in the characterization and why should you buy the opposition one the difference is that the only proposition notion that like the reason for swaying is based on exposure, right? Because they claim that people are like just fully informed and uh, like fully able to digest all of this. And this is why the only thing that happens is like when they get exposed to these uh, different things. Opposition on the other hand tells you that there's like three different things that like uh, uh, that factors that people um, take into account when decision making um, beyond that. One, it's pre-existing paradigms. Secondly, it's the amount of info. And second, uh, and thirdly, it's emotion. And based on this, this is more likely that you buy into our characterization. We take this clash then, furthermore, of an independent reason of Johanna's argument that's never been responded to, that even in the case where these people are uh, like informed on both sides, like you get uh, more coverage of scandals on the outside of the house. These people are less relevant because you don't change their behavior too much. In the best case of proposition, you get a minor change in like their polarization and like um, read that the, the harm that has occurred under extremism is just so incredibly bad that you vote opposition. Thank you, Speaker, for the final remarks. And I invite the government reply to conclude this debate. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Great, thank you. Panel, I want to be very, very clear as to what Germany did and did not need to prove to win this debate. Germany did not need to show that radicalism was bad, that populism was bad, that polarization exists. They instead needed to show that upon implementing our policy, there would be active and substantial harm that is tangible in everyone's everyday lives. And that is what at the end of this debate they have failed to do because they can come up here and talk all they want about terrorism and rioting. It's ironic though, that in a status quo that they defend in which this exists. And I would argue that any chance that we have to improve this status quo is grounds on which team Spain wins this debate. Now, what I wanna do is give like respond to the only three pushes they give in this debate as to why we make situations substantially worse. If I disprove these, they have lost this debate. There are three. The first is populism. Look, a few responses. Populism arises as a direct result of discontent with the political establishment. This looks like things like viewing other people as bigots, like hatred to people across the other side of the political aisle. Look, we don't think it's a coincidence that over the same span of time that political polarization was at its worst, that we saw the rise of right-wing populist parties in Europe and the United States. We think that it is far more likely to have populism on their side of the house. But secondly, on our side of the house, populists are now given equal voices compared to everyone else in the political sphere. Look, Trump was only able to be elected as a populist leader because he essentially had a monopoly over what Fox published on him. Now he is forced to share the stage with a bunch of other well-informed Democrats and well-informed independents. Look, people support populist leaders because of the vague promises they give them. Now we give you a mechanism whereby politicians must deliver better policy because they are on the same stage and actively competing with politicians who are trying to gain votes. That is the mechanism whereby we do not allow populism to happen. That falls. The second thing they tell us is that there, people are going to move towards right-wing sources. We tell you two things. They say we don't respond like we did. One, there are, the majority of people that they themselves concede to are passive viewers. This means they lack initiative to go out and seek news sources, which Germany literally concedes the vast majority of people have not even heard of. So look, if the price for lessening political polarization for the majority on our side of the house is having a tiny majority minority of people who are likely already polarized and radicalized and looking at fake news, then we're, we're willing to take that exchange. But secondly, we tell you it's not even mutually exclusive. Like we're willing to defend regulation of social media. We think that generally speaking, it is like becoming more and more well-regulated. This is a non-point. And thirdly, now on harm to minorities, look, they barely even delivered the substantive point. So realistically, it's not that important. But look at how the harm here is symmetrical, which is to say black trans women already face a very hard time in the status quo. The difference is that people who never considered that trans people are real now have access to that information. And that change is exclusive to our side of the house. Now, look, those were the only three reasons they gave us as to why we gave substantial harms. The fact that all three of those fall means that they have lost this debate. But look at everything 
thing that we tell you now, I want to point out two very important things. The first is that we improve all three democratic institutions. They don't respond to this once with centrist policy, with better policy, by humanizing political opposition, by having judges do their job. The extent of the rebuttal to this is it won't happen. Look, it will. Judges, if fixing a political, uh, sorry, a broken political system, even if you like buy one or two of their harms, if we're able to fix this political system, that alone should win us this debate because the political system we live in affects literally everyone, not just minorities. The second thing we tell you is that we're going to lesser polarization. The extent of their rebuttal here is that, oh, Ben Shapiro and populists are going to be the only one on news sources, essentially mischaracterizing what we tell you. Look, we're willing to concede the fact that maybe we don't convince the small minority of radicals, but largely those exist on both sides. Where do we win? The silent majority of viewers who Germany concedes are the most important. The people who are open to new ideas just haven't had the ability to access them yet. Look, maybe they don't change their mind, but at least they have a reason to believe what they believe. I am very proud to propose.